yeah, take it away. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Matthew, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. I am so excited to um, present both the work and just be with you all here. Um, so I look forward to any questions or suggestions that you want to make, because I find that science is best when everybody has a chance to contribute. So, um, so with that, I'll just dive right in and just really emphasize to you the problem that we work on in our group is really the problem of tuberculosis. So as you can see, tuberculosis remains a global health problem. I always tell people here that, you know, when I talk about tuberculosis and I talk about impact that it has on the world, we like to think about uh, an estimate of a quarter to a third of the population has been infected with the causative agent mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, this results in about 4,000 deaths per day. And for the first time in a very, very long time, the numbers have, are rising in the number of deaths as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, one of the things that makes TB really, really incredibly difficult to understand is the layers and many, many layers of heterogeneity that exist at every scale you look. So if you look in human populations infected with TB, the estimates are that um, a quarter to a third um, or uh, one in 10 individuals develops active disease, which is characterized by like um, coughing up blood, weight loss, and fatigue, while the other 90% are virtually asymptomatic. Now, not all hope is lost because we do have an antibiotic regimen, but I just want you to take a look here. That antibiotic regimen is um, about six to nine months of a four drug regimen. So when we think about the places where TB is most endemic, it's really important to recognize that places in the global south also really need um, really exquisite um, healthcare distribution systems in order to make sure that everybody has access to the antibiotics that they need. Now, what would be a transformative solution here? A transformative solution, as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, would be a protective vaccine. Now, um, there is a vaccine that is administered called BCG. BCG is not wholly protective against TB. Some estimates put it at 18% effective, others place it a little bit higher. But um, the argument that I'd like to submit to you is that I think we could do better and it's a moral imperative that we do better. So, okay, so this is where we'd like to be, a protective licensed TB vaccine. That's the goal, the stated goal of my research group. The question is, is how are we going to fill in the gaps that remain in order to understand how we'll get there? Okay. So let me just highlight for you how, what we understand about the life cycle of TB. So TB is transmitted via aerosol. You have droplet-sized bacteria that then make their way into the airways of another individual. So another individual will inhale the bacteria. These droplet-sized bacteria then make their way into the alveolar space of the lung. What's amazing about the alveolar space of the lung is that you have alveolar macrophages patrolling the alveoli. Once the bacterium is sensed, um, the macrophage may phagocytose or take up these bacteria, which really initiates the innate immune response. So after the initiation of this innate immune response, you have the recruitment of other macrophages and other myeloid cells to the site of infection, resulting in what's called a granuloma. So by definition, if you ask a pathologist, a granuloma is a collection of macrophages. But in the setting of TB, the TB granuloma goes on to take it on its own additional character. What do I mean by that? The TB granuloma will then subsequently recruit lymphocytes to form this kind of lymphocyte cuff. Now, each granuloma, you may have several in an infected, infected animal or individual. Each granuloma is really marching to the beat of its own drum. So you can have a granuloma that fully sterilizes infection and a granuloma that does not in the same individual. You can have a granuloma that fibrosis and you can have a granuloma that necrosis. And when we think about granuloma necrosis, this is one of the biggest ways for this kind of life cycle of transmission to continue because then you have this granuloma that kind of degrades, the bacteria then are dispelled back into the airway for subsequent kind of rounds of transmission. Okay, so this is what we understand about the life cycle. Obviously, I wouldn't have a job if there weren't gaps that needed to be filled. So what are some of those gaps? Some of those gaps include that we still really don't understand what host determinants of control are. I think a lot of the paradigms um, that have been established in the murine model have been hard to translate to human systems. Um, open questions still remain about how bacterial virulence is truly regulated. And obviously, these knowledge gaps are fueled by limitations. TB is not a model organism by any stretch of the imagination. I was just in the BSL-3 this morning. This is a pathogen that doubles every 24 hours. 
Um, I tell all my students, I was like, if you want to do a new biochemical assay in TB, um, good luck. Like, I want to support you, but you're building it yourself. There's no such thing as a kit to do a TB experiment. So obviously, the constellation of these um, limitations kind of um, kind of really limit the, the knowledge that um, the knowledge and the speed with which we generate new knowledge. Okay, so that sounds like a sad story, but why do I do this work? Why do I have hope? Um, and I'm going to show you one example of why I have hope. So this is work in the non-human primate model of TB. The non-human primate model is the best kind of model that reflects the kind of spectrum of disease that we see in human. And what was done in this study is they bronchoscopically instill between five to 10 colony forming units in a particular lobe of the lung. And then they can monitor disease dynamics over time. What's amazing about these experiments is that these BSL-3s have PET-CT imaging. So you can look at local regions of the lung to kind of identify where individual granulomas are. And then at the time of necropsy, you can go isolate these individual lesions and plate to identify the total number of bacteria that are culturable, as well as really try to quantify by quantif how many total bacteria were ever present by quantifying by PCR the number of chromosomal equivalents. And really what I wanna draw your attention to is the, the panel on the left. So the y-axis here is colony forming units per lesion. Um, and these are just different time points, four weeks or 11 weeks, and then animals that were clinically defined as active or latent. But really what I wanna draw your attention to is right here. Um, what I wanna draw your attention to is that bacterial sterilization is possible. So this is in the absence of any antibiotics, the immune response can handle um, TB in some of these granulomas. Now, the question that we would all love to be able to answer is what are the determinants of granuloma sterilization and how does that distinguish itself from the granulomas that do not sterilize? So one of the really amazing things about this last century in immunology has been, has been the introduction of really high throughput um, single cell based tools to really do deep molecular phenotyping. So in order to gain some insight into what are the potential immunologic signatures that really dictate bacterial sterilization in individual granulomas, uh, we were fortunate enough to collaborate with Joanne Flynn, Alex Shalik, and Sarah Fortune's group to really um, characterize the granulomas um, of non-human primates um, with single cell, uh, single cell resolution. And really what I wanna draw your attention to is that there's a lot of different cell types present in a granuloma. Um, what we really wanted to first ask is, was there an association between particular T cell phenotypes and granuloma sterilization? And we were able to find a small but statistically significant correlation between bacterial burden and uh, T cells that were kind of uh, what we defined as cytotoxic T cells. So this was really exciting because it provided us with kind of some um, mechanistic hypotheses to dissect or mechanistic hypotheses that were kind of reflective of kind of what are the determinants in vivo of control. So what's the evidence for CD8 T cells? We oftentimes think about CD4 T cells in the context of infection, especially with intracellular pathogens. What's the evidence that CD8 T cells play a role? Okay, so um, I'm just gonna show you a few pieces of data to help motivate the importance of CD8 T cells. The first two is if you take a beta-2M knockout um, mouse and you infect it with TB, that mouse quickly succumbs to infection. If you take a vaccinated mouse and you um, deplete CD8 T cells using an anti-CD8 antibody, the bacterial burden compared to kind of a control antibody, um, the bacterial burden increases, suggesting that CD8 T cells play a role in kind of total organismal bacterial, control, bacterial burden. And then really excitingly, if you go to the non-human primate model and take a BCG vaccinated animal and then deplete CD8 T cells, what you find is that the bacterial burden goes up. And this is almost as similar as a naive animal that was not vaccinated. So um, these are just kind of some, in, some kind of whole animal insights that CD8 T cells play kind of a organismal role, a systems level role in bacterial burden in the context of TB infection, but what might be happening at the cellular level? So I like to identify myself as a cellular kind of systems immunologist. And so let's dig in a little bit more to think about how CD8 T cells may play a role. 
So obviously when we think about the context of infection, we're thinking about phagocytose bacteria or, or um, inside some type of phagocyte. That could be a macrophage, it could be a dendritic cell. And the hypothesis is, is that, okay, now there's some amount of antigen presentation that occurs both on MHC class one and class two. But for the sake of this talk, we're gonna focus on MHC class one, given our interest in CDA T cells. So um, these peptide MHCs will present to CDA T cells. CDA T cells can then be primed. Upon recognition of an infected cell, T cells may inquire um, and expand their effector function and either secrete perforin granulysin and granzymes to contribute to uh, some amount of cytotoxicity or se secretion of cytokines. Um, and this may ultimately result in the lysis of infected cells and MTB. So previous work has suggested that granulysin um, can contribute to uh, bacterial control. And in this series of studies, from the Maudlin lab at the University of California, what they did is they took recombinant granulysin, added that in culture um, with MTB, and then looked at bacterial, bacterial burden or bacterial killing over time. And what, was, what you can see here is these black circles are granulysin-treated cells. And, and as you increase the concentration of granulysin, you see an increase in bacterial killing. Okay, so this suggests that granulysin can contribute to alterations in bacterial physiology in exceeded culture. And then Judy Lieberman's group then subsequently showed that um, in a cellular model, that, the, that there was synergy between granulysin and granzymes to contribute to bacterial control, with the hypothesis that granulysin enables the delivery of granzymes into pathogens, and that these granzymes can then subsequently disrupt the electron transport chain in bacteria. Okay. So this is all great. So we have some kind of systems level analysis in this unbiased single cell analysis that, okay, uh, that there's an association between CD8 T cells and control that we can deplete CD8 T cells and that gives rise to enhanced bacterial burden. And that we know now that some of these cytotoxic molecules can alter bacterial physiology. So this is all great. This is saying, okay, there's a role for CD8 T cells. Um, but the question that I ask myself as an engineer is how do we take advantage of these observations when we think about designing a vaccine? So the devil's in the details. Um, and I tell people often, you know, it'd be great to be able to, de 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 develop and design new vaccines, but an ongoing knowledge gap, knowledge gap that exists for us is really just understanding what are the antigens that an infected phagocyte is presenting? Now, why is this important? Well, obviously, if you're going to design a subunit vaccine, it'd be great to understand what are the antigens presented, what should be those subunit um, proteins in a, what should be the proteins in a subunit vaccine. Um, obviously, when we think about antigen presentation in the context of a bacterial infection, an intracellular bacterial infection, is very different from, say, for example, what are the antigens presented by a virally infected cell or a virally infected cell. That virus is using host machinery in order to generate new proteins. Um, and so the, hypoth the, the question we wanted to ask is in with mycobacterium tuberculosis that has over 4,000 different proteins, is there selection or is there some stringency that the kind of the host pathogen interface play imposes on which antigens are ultimately uh, presentable on MHC class one? So that was the question we set out to answer. And I like to just tell people upfront that I really center all of as many experiments as possible in human cells, specifically primary human cells to be as close to what I think the, um, disease in the host pathogen interface looks like in humans. So in order to begin to dissect these questions, what we wanted to address is what are the antigens in fact, uh, presented by TB infected macrophages? All right, so the way that we do this is um, in our group, research group, um, we make uh, monocyte derived macrophages. These are derived from CD14 positively selected cells. These are just from healthy random donors. Um, we differentiate those macrophages or those monocytes in MCSF for six days. And um, for six days, then we infect with virulent MTB in the biosafety level three. Um, we infected a, roughly at a multiplicity of infection of three. This results in about 50% of the cells infected. We also do a mock infection, which includes all the media changes and washes, just doesn't include bacteria. 
We then let the infection go for 72 hours um, prior to uh, MHC class one uh, immunoprecipitation. The reason we go for 72 hours was really just to try to see something. We wanted to go as long as we could before the macrophages started dying. So this was kind of our kind of our tipping point between excessive macrophage death and um, enough time to be able to hopefully see something, given that we were a little worried up front because when we think about the biomass of a bacterium relative to the biomass of the cytosol of the host that's also being processed for MHC1 presentation. Okay, so we do this, we, um, we lyse our cells after 72 hours post-infection, we do a uh, MHC class one immunoprecipitation with the W632 antibody. Um, we then have these uh, peptide MHC complexes. Really importantly, what we care about are what are the peptides, not about the MHC molecules. So we then take our sample and we uh, apply a molecular weight cutoff filter to separate the MHC molecules from the peptides that were bound. And then we do liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. So this is one method that we've optimized to do this. We've also optimized a second method to do this work. And instead, after our MHC class one pull down, we actually do a solid phrase extraction on a C18 column and then fractionate by reverse phase LC and then do liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. Okay, so this is super exciting. We have a method. Um, the question now you might ask is, does this method actually recover TB-derived peptides in the soup of everything else that could be derived from host-derived proteins? And um, the answer is yes. Um, but first, I'll just show you a little bit of kind of how many peptides we're able to detect in an experiment like this. We're able to detect on the order of thousands of total peptides. Um, uh, here, we don't see a really pronounced difference between cells that underwent a TB infection versus those that underwent a mock, T mock infection. But really importantly, even though we're able to identify thousands of total peptides, on the right-hand graph, what I'm showing you is the total number of TB peptides that we're able to detect. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that in any given experiment, we detect between one and maybe about seven different TB-derived peptides. So um, when we saw one, we were like, okay, can we do a little bit better? You know, so we spent a lot of time optimizing these methods. Um, and what I, think I'm, what I think we're detecting are probably the most, um, most highly abundant TB-derived peptides presented on MHC class one at this point. But it, nevertheless, it's really exciting for us, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so um, again, devil's in the details. And one of the things that's really important to know is that when you do tandem mass spectrometry, um, one of the really important um, aspects of a, these types of experiments is that you really, really wanna be sure that what these algorithms that search your MSMS spectra are predicting or are accurate. Now, when you're doing an LCMSMS analysis with the immunopeptidome, you can't say, look, I digested with trypsin, so I'm expecting to have a lysine or an arginine as my final amino acid. Now, when you're doing these experiments with uh, the immunopeptidome, you have maybe a size expectation, but those size expectations are really difficult to code into these algorithms. So we needed an alternative way to really confirm um, what we were seeing, that what we were seeing by LCMSMS was true. So the way that we do this is that we uh, validated all of our um, all of our hits with a stable isotope labeled synthetic peptide. And so the idea here is that we have our biological peptide that we identified in an, ex in an experiment. And then what we can do is we can synthetically uh, generate a synthetic heavy labeled uh, heavy labeled peptide where one of the amino acids has a, has a heavy labeled amino acid incorporated, which allows us by mass spectrometry to be able to distinguish by the mass to charge ratio, the biological peptide versus the synthetic peptide. So what we can do is we can say, look, we're actually gonna only, when our, in our discovery runs, use 75% of our sample to identify as many peptides as possible, and then hold back 25% of that peptide uh, that mixture to then be able to go in and validate that the predictions that these algorithms were making were actually true. So that's in fact what we do. So we can actually um, take that last remaining 25% of our sample, spike in these stable isotope labeled peptides into our MHC peptide mixture, and then uh, look by mass spectrometry to see, yes, that we're seeing both our biological peptide and our synthetic peptide. And the only difference should be this heavy, this mass offset that was introduced by the incorporation of the stable synthetic isotope labeled peptide. 
And then what we can do is say, look, we're looking for two things. We're looking for one, that our fragmentation spectra match. So our MSMS spectra match. So how those individual peptides fragment um, are identical. And then the second thing we want to be able to say is that those individual peptides, given that their hydrophobicity has not changed and only the mass has changed, they should actually co-elute when we run our uh, chromatogram. Okay, so that is the goal. If we can make sure that these two um, uh, biologic constraints are met, then we're going to call our peptide real. Um, so let's just show you what these data look like. So here we're tracking a specific peptide derived from a protein uh, called ESXA. And what we can see here is that in our plus TB sample, here we can see our heavy peptide, our light peptide from our endogenous sample, and they are co-eluting. When we look in our mock sample, we can see the heavy labeled peptide that we spiked in, but we see no evidence of the endogenous peptide in the mock sample, consistent with our hypothesis that this is truly bona fide an MTB, MTB infection derived peptide presented on MHC class one. The second thing that we can do is we want to confirm that the fragmentation spectra of our MS of our peptides are identical. So we can do that as we can now look at our MSMS -MS spectra. We can look at all the different ion fragmentation ions, and we and we look and make sure that they're. Um, have identical MSMS fragmentation spectra. The only place where we don't see identical MSMS fragmentation spectra is at the place where we introduced our heavy labeled peptide because we would expect to see a mass offset there. Okay, so this is super exciting. Um, we actually went on and did this for every single peptide that we identified in our analyses. And I'm just showing you a few examples here. But what was really exciting is that when we took a step back. So these experiments are incredibly time consuming and tedious, but we love to do it because it really gives us confidence that what we're seeing is real. But what was really exciting for us is when we took a step back and we actually looked at the different peptides and the stories that it was telling us about what was being presented from MTB. So here I'm just showing you a summary of all of the data that we generated. Keep in mind that these experiments were just, again, done with healthy human donors. So we were not HLA typing for HLA homogeneity when we were doing this experiment. We were just taking random people with random HLAs and then HLA typing afterwards. And what you can see here is that um, we're able in some cases to see different peptides from the same protein oh like ESXA or this, um, um, this ESXJ KPW family. Um, and so that was really exciting. And then the other thing that really caught our eye is when we actually said, okay, what is what are all of these proteins? Do they belong to a particular pathway? Do they tell us something about a particular enrichment of particular TB proteins that are being presented on MHC class one? Okay, and this is where it got really exciting for us as um, part-time microbiologist is that when we said, okay, do we see an enrichment of TB-derived peptides from particular secretion systems? Um, the answer was very clear. So here's what it looks, here's what the TB proteome looks like if you just label every TB protein by the secretion system. So gray is no secretion system, red is the type seven secretion system, and in the blue and purple and white are other secretion systems. But what I hope catches your eye is that when we look at the immunopeptidome of the MTB derived samples, there was a very uh, strong enrichment of peptides derived from the type seven secretion system presented on MHC class one. And this got super exciting for us um, because the type seven secretion system is one of the most widely studied um, secretion systems in TB. So we know a lot about it and a lot about the functions of the protein secreted by um, the type seven secretion system. Okay, so the type seven secretion system, just for um, just to get everybody on the same page, um, there are many of them in MTB. There's about five. There's ESX one, two, three, four, and five. Um, we were able to identify proteins um, present uh, that are secreted by ESX one, three, or five. Um, so this was really exciting for us. But um, before I tell you anything more, um, what you need to know is that these these kind of Secretion nanomachines allow proteins to be secreted from the cytol cytosol across the inner membrane, through the periplasm, through the outer membrane, and into the supernate of an exenic culture. So um, let me tell you a little bit about one of these proteins in particular, um, ESXA, because it plays an even more important role when we think about um, the biology of uh, secretion in TB. 
So ESXA is actually secreted as a heterodimer with ESXB. And one of the things that has been widely observed in the field is that upon TB infection, you can see markers of phagosomal damage or membrane damage at the site of TB infect, at the site of the TB containing phagosome. And one of the things that uh, Jeff Cox's lab uh, discovered about a decade ago is that if you infect with a mutant that lacks ESAT6, which is also ESXA, what you see is that, look, upon TB infection, you see markers of endomembrane damage. So you see P6C2 and ubiquitination coming to the site of uh, the TB containing phagosome. But when you knock out a ESXA, you lose the co-localization of these markers, consistent with a model that ESXA contributes to phagosomal damage. And this is going to be really important for the rest of the talk. Okay, so this is exciting for us. And so what was, ex um, what was really um, important for us is that, okay, we can go from this kind of discovery analysis where we're just trying to ask, what are the peptides presented from MTB on MHC class one to specific hypotheses that we then wanted to test? So we said, okay, we see this enrichment of type seven secretion system substrates on this on peptide MHCs of TB infected cells. Now the question is, how do we get there? So we know that we've got an infected phagocyte. We know that we're seeing these TB derived peptides presented on MHC class one. The question is, is what are the biological mechanisms that enable these peptides to be presented on MHC class one? So we wanted to test two different hypotheses here. So the first hypothesis that we wanted to test was that um, these peptides, these proteins were gaining access to MHC class one via the vacuolar pathway where you would hypothesize that there's lysosome fusion with the MTB containing phagosome. You have digestion of TB derived proteins occurring in the phagosome, and then you have direct um, loading of MHC one at the, at the phagolysosome. And this is what enables antigen presentation on the surface. So we wanted to um, look at that first by quantifying either the co-localization of LAMP1 or MHC class one with TB containing phagosomes. And what we found is that TB um, did not very strongly co-localize with either MHC class one or LAMP1 in our, in our infection settings. And this you might expect, we're talking about macrophages here as opposed to dendritic cells, which have really much stronger evidence of cross-presentation and phagosome co-localization with MHC class one. All right, so um, that hypothesis did not test correct. What are alternative models to propose or explore? The alternative model that we wanted to the next test was that for, um, that we could instead have a, um, a damaged phagosome, which would enable selective uh, uh, release of particular TB proteins into the cytosol for processing by the proteasome, and then subsequent loading of these peptides in the ER to MHC class one. And what was really exciting for us is consistent with what I described to you about the, the Cox lab previously showing that TB co-localizes with markers of endomembrane damage, we were able to also see that in our setting here. So we stained um, TBs in green, we stained for galactin-3, which is a marker of endomembrane damage, and we stained for P62 as well. And what you can see is that all the time points we analyzed, we see that um, TB, there's a fraction of TB that are co-localized with these markers of phagosomal rupture. And then we said, okay, this is super great. Um, can we take this one step further and say, okay, can we now think about how we might leverage bacterial genetics to also be able to explore components of the bact um, bacterial genetics and their con contribution to antigen presentation? So we we're fortunate enough to get a TB mutant um, if the ESX1 pathway, so that's this ECCCA1 transposon mutant, and this mutant is known to have a uh, defect in secretion of ESXA, as well as a defect in phagosomal membrane damage. And that's what I'm showing you here. So when we infect it with wild type MTB and look for galactin 3, again, we see all this co-localization with MTB. But when we infect with this ECCCA1 transposon mutant, that co-localization with galactin-3 is lost. Im importantly suggesting that, okay, when we infect with this TB mutant, um, the phagosomal damage is, uh, is no longer. And this was really important to us because then it allowed us to specifically ask the question of how can we mechanistically dissect the host and bacterial determinants of antigen presentation on MHC class one. Okay. So um, how might we think about this? So we wanted to, we kind of like 
we always do a pen and pencil experiment before we actually go to the mass spectrometer. So we wanted to think about how do we, how do we think about secretion of these TB substrates? So um, what was really exciting for us is that in our experiments, in some of the donors we identified in some of the HLA types, we identified two different peptides from two different secretion systems, one from the ESX1 system and a second one from the ESXJ system um, or the ESX5 system. So we wanted to say, okay, now if we can develop our mass spectrometry methods to specifically track these individual peptides, we can begin to try to quantify how different perturbations to the host or the bacterium alter um, antigen presentation. So what is known about the sec relative secretion of the ESX1 and the ESX5 system? So people have done similar experiments in axenic culture and just broth culture and said, let's mutate the ESX1 system and ask how that impacts the secretion of proteins from the ESX5 system. And in an axenic culture, these processes are independent. So if you knock out ESX1 activity, ESX5 substrates have no absolute no defect in protein secretion. Um, but when we were thinking about our system, when we we're thinking about being inside of a macrophage, one of the things that we hypothesized is that if ESX1 secretes ESXA, ESXA contributing to phagosomal damage, is it possible that ESXA in its contribution to phagosomal damage means that we lose the ability to damage the phagosomal membrane? And therefore, when we lose the ability to damage the phagosomal membrane, ESXJ no longer has a way to gain access to the cytosol. So that was the hypothesis that we wanted to test. And so our approach here is that we infected with wild type MTB or an ESX1 mutant, and then we examined antigen presentation on MHC class one. So I often tell people this is the closest to the equivalent of a mouse experiment that I get to traditionally. So what we were able to do in this setting is that we actually bought um, CD14 monocytes that had specific HLA types from stem cell, where we could really say, okay, we're going to track these specific peptides presented and really use the mass spectrometer as a way to quantify MHC1 presentation in a highly targeted manner. And obviously this introduces many, many additional challenges because now instead of taking 50 million cells and just doing one IP for discovery, we're taking our, um, we're taking our cells and we're splitting them across multiple different perturbations or infection conditions. So we really needed to say, can we make the mass spectrometer work better in this particular setting? And so what my graduate student Owen Letty did is he, he enabled, he developed this, he or extended this method called SureQuant, which allows us to really um, detect MTB peptides with very low sample input. So many of the experiments I described to you prior, we were using about 50 million cells as input, but what Owen wanted to do was actually push the limit of what was possible. So Owen said, okay, can I do this with 10 million cells of input um, and identify peptides, um, this ESXA peptide? He then said, okay, can I go even further to five or 2 million cells of input and really be able to track specific peptides? The reason that this works is that instead of just using, going after every potential peptide that the mass spectrometer sees, we're saying mass spec, we only want you to fragment when you see this mass of charge of this peptide precursor mass and really focus your fragmentation time and your cycle time on peptides that match this mass. And so this really allows us to dig much deeper into a mass spectrometry run than you would be able to if you're doing a totally unbiased, unsupervised analysis. Okay, so this is one, um, this was one enabling technology that really allowed us to really specifically track individual peptides. There was a second innovation that was also required and we needed a way to really control for um, uh, doing seven different IPs across seven different experimental conditions. And the way that we do that is that we actually use these internal standards for quantitative immunopeptidomics that we call HIP MHCs. So these HIP MHCs are, preloaded with a UV cleavable peptide. You can do a UV mediated peptide exchange and then load on these MHCs a particular peptide of interest. And then we can quantify the concentration of these HIP MHCs by ELISA. And then we can actually spike them in to all of our samples at a known concentration. So we can use that effectively as a way to normalize across of our RIPs. And then we can again then spike in our sure quant standards to really quantify particular peptides of interest. 
So this is how we try to be as rigorously quantitative as possible, controlling for really going after low abundance peptides with this sure quant method, but then also controlling for IP efficiency using these HIP-MHCs. Okay, so that was a lot of technical jargon to be able to get to the experiment that we wanted to do. So the question that we wanted to ask again was does ESX1 activity contribute to presentation of MTB peptides on MHC class one? So again, our approach here was to infect with wild type MTB or ESX1 mutant and examine antigen presentation on MHC class one. The first thing that we wanted to test was whether or not um, infection with this mutant altered MHC class one expression on the cell surface. It did not at the time points that we analyzed. Again, we're doing our experiments at 72 hours. So, okay, so this is the best we can do. We've got, um, we've controlled for MHC class one expression. We've also at this point controlled for uh, bacterial burden. So we know at the time points that we're analyzing the bacterial burden in the ESX1 mutant versus the versus wild type are virtually indistinguishable. So, now we can say, let's go ahead and quantify the presentation of these, um, of these peptides derived from either ESXA or ESXJ. Okay, so now we can do a quantitative analysis to quantify the relative abundance of this ESXA and ESXJ peptide. Keep in mind here that because of methionine oxidation, we're actually tracking two forms of this ESXJ peptide. And so that's why you see these two different colors here. So here in our for mock infection, as I've shown you prior, um, we don't see any of these TB-derived peptides presented. Obviously, when we infect with wild-type MTB, we see um, all of these peptides presented. Now, importantly, the question is, is what happens when you infect with an ESX1 mutant? We know if our experiment works because ESX1 contributes to ESXA secretion, we should see that entirely lost. So if we don't see some ESXA entirely lost, we've done something wrong. Um, now, what we really wanna know is does ESXA or ESX1 activity contribute to presentation of these ESXJ peptides? Because in exenic culture, our hypothesis would be that they're independent of one another. Now, what we've ended up finding is that actually when we go to the macrophage context, we actually find that ESXA or ESX1 activity really uh, is required for presentation of not just ESX1 peptides, but also peptides presented by the ESX5 system. So while we are able to say in exenic culture that these pathway, that these um, that these secretion systems operate independently, when we think about these secretion systems in the context of an infected phagocyte, there's much more nuance because there's all these kind of additional layers of additional membranes that TB proteins must cross beyond the outer membrane. We've got the phagosola membrane as kind of the third layer of the sandwich. Okay, so for those of you who know anything about TB, one of the things that also comes uh, uh, with the loss of ESX1 activity is that one of, is the induction of type one interferons. So the ESX1 system uh, in mechanisms that we still are working to understand um, contributes to robust type one interferon signaling during infection. So when we saw these data, we were curious to say, okay, we see that, look, we see reduced um, presentation of these peptides, virtually absent. Um, I'll go that far to say that. Um, and one, one thing we wanted to control for was, okay, when we lose ESX1 activity, we're also losing interferon. So is it possible that what we're seeing is a consequence of interferon signaling and not really the activity of the secretion systems in the way that we're thinking about it as a kind of a phagosomal membrane release question? So we took the ESX1 mutant, we then treated it with interferon beta to and quantified MHC1 presentation. And what you can see here is that this has absolutely, add back of interferon has absolutely no impact on the rescue of these peptides presented by MHC class one. So our takeaway from these experiments is that MHC class one activity um, presentation of these ESX uh, type seven secretion system peptides really re rely on an active type seven secretion system, specifically an active ESX one system. So that was the hypothesis that we had. Our data suggests this thus far. Could we have some alternative um, assay to confirm the results of our mass spectrometer. So we're really fortunate that one of these peptides is ESXJ peptide. Um, the Lewinson lab at OHSU had previously identified a T cell clone that has the ability to recognize this peptide. 
So what we did here, and this is a really busy slide and I apologize, is we were able to do a T cell co-culture assay to really confirm the results of our, uh, of our mass spec experiments. So on the top row are mock infected cells, on the bottom row are TB infected cells. Um, each column is a different uh, perturbation. So we have no peptide. We have an HIV peptide that we also loaded these cells with. We have the peptide from ESXJ. We have, an we have a condition where the T cells don't see macrophages at all. And then we have an, a condition where we infect with this ESX1 activity mutant. And here, the only time our, uh, our T cell clone has any reactivity in the mock setting is when we load the, uh, the macrophages with the cognate peptide. So on the, um, so on the y-axis, we're looking at CD107A as a marker of degranulation. And on the x-axis, we're looking at GMCSF. And you can see this really nice population of T cells that's responding by producing um, GMCSF and degranulating. Now, when we look at TB infected cells, um, we see that there's this population of uh, T cells that are reacting to TB infected macrophages. Um, this is increased by adding back more peptides, suggesting that, look, we're not fully saturating the system. But really importantly, when we infect with this ESX1 activity mutant, um, it basically looks like the no peptide mock infection condition. And this is really important because it's consistent with the model that we propose that ESX1 activity is really important, not only for antigen presentation now, but also for the ability for T cells to recognize these cells. Okay, so this is really exciting. Um, now, what I'll say is that we there's a whole rest of this paper, um, and I, if you're interested, I encourage you to look at our bioarchive preprint, where we started to, where we then asked about um, the perturbation of either host processes, uh, inhibition of the cathepsins, um, inhibition of lysosomal acidification, and inhibition of the proteasome. And what I what was really exciting to us is that acute inhibition of the cathepsins or proteasome activity actually did not lower MTB-derived peptide presentation, while it was capable of altering host-derived peptide presentation. So we don't really know the mechanism of what's happening there, but it's really interesting that the kind of the paradigms that control and the mechanisms that control host peptide presentation um, seem to be slightly distinct from those uh, that control bacterial-derived peptide presentation. Okay, so the big goal of these experiments were to say, look, we want to be able to take this insight and design better vaccines. So what is this? what do these experiments actually tell us for vac about vaccine design? Let's take a step back. So TB vaccine, as I mentioned to you before, the most the, the clinically approved TB vaccine is BCG, which has been administered for over a hundred years. BCG is an attenuated form of Mycobacterium bovis, which is cattle TB. Now, one of the things that came out of whole genome sequencing efforts in comparing BCG to TB was the identification of regions of difference. And what regions of difference are, are regions of the BCG genome or regions of the TB genome that appear totally absent in BCG. And so what does that look like um, in our setting? And does that have any kind of, does what are, do our findings that we made um, have any relationship with these regions of difference uh, present in BCG? And the answer is yes. So here is just a depiction of the MP MTB genome. Depicted here is the region of difference one in BCG. So BCG lacks all of these genes. I've put a star at, the, uh, uh, at explicit proteins that we are identifying as presented by MTB infected cells. Um, that would be totally absent, genetically absent in BCG. Now, importantly, let's take this one step further, because as I mentioned to you, ESXA or ESAT6 contributes to phagosomal permeabilization. So if our model is true that phagosomal permeabilization is really important for the presentation of TB-derived antigens, now this whole kind of pathway that we think is really important for a presentation on MHC class one is totally absent in, in a BCG infected macrophage, for example. So um, this is kind of like, this is like the dream result in my opinion, because it's like, look, we wanted to do this totally unbiased analysis where our hope was that we were going to come up with kind of actionable mechanistic and uh, insights as well as 
the specific identification of specific TB proteins that can be leveraged in next generation vaccine design. And I'd like to submit to you the answer that I think that we're on our way. So there's a lot of questions that still remain. One question that remains is how does VCG, if at all, um, uh, prime CD8 mediated immunity? And I draw your attention to the following experiment here where um, in non-human primates um, that were um, vaccinated intravenously with BCG. One of the remarkable observations is that intravenous delivery of BCG results in very, very, very little disease, if at all, um, it consistent with decreased bacterial burden. But one of the really interesting um, immunologic observations in these experiments is that IV BCG gave rise to far, far many more CD8 T cells in the bronchial alveolar lavage of uh, these vaccinated animals. Now, a question is, is this actually, uh, anti are these antigen specific um, uh, CD8 T cells or are they just a bystander infiltrating uh, lymphocyte response? So that is a big question that we'd love to be able to answer going forward. What are these CD8 T cells doing? But maybe in the interest of kind of uh, sparking some more dialogue and hearing from you all about what questions you might have, I'll just start to wrap up here. Um, so in conclusion, what I hope to have shown you today is that we optimize mass spectrometry methods to discover, validate, and quantify MTB peptides presented on MHC class one, that uh, TB infected human macrophages present type seven secretion system substrates on MHC class one. I'll give you a little uh, spoiler alert. We've also done these experiments now on monocyte derived dendritic cells. And actually believe it or not, the trends are very similar. So we're seeing almost the same exact peptides being presented. And, and lastly, that uh, from a mechanistic perspective, uh, that ESX1 activity, the uh, a specific type seven secretion system contributes to presentation of MTB antigens on MHC class one, possibly through membrane damage. So with that, um, I have to obviously acknowledge the people who did all this work. Every experiment that I described to you is done by this jolly fellow right here, Owen Letty. Um, he's a third, or I guess now a fourth year graduate student in my group. Um, I don't do this by myself. I'm fortunate enough to have the amazing group that surrounds me every day, bringing joy and bringing new ideas. I'm deeply grateful to my collaborators, Amy Barzak for The Mutant, Mary Carrington and Yuko Yuki for um, HLA typing, Forrest White for collaboration in the mass spectrometry, Dave and Debbie Lewinson for the T-cell clones, and for you for your attention. And I am happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks so much for that, Brian. That was a beautiful talk. Um, really, really enjoyed that. And we already have questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to ask this one on uh, behalf of Noah first, and then Fred will come to you next. Um, so Brian, uh, Noah says, hi, Brian, super cool seminar. Sorry, since I, probably, <laughs> since I probably missed this during your talk. Does this mean that the peptides may be loaded on the MHC1 molecules from the extracellular space rather than loading them from processing myco mycobacteria, in particular regarding the necessity of the two secretion systems? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I would say right now, we don't know where the loading is occurring. Um, so what I can tell you is that it is it appears independent of, it appears independent of cathepsin activity. It appears independent of the traditional mechanisms that we traditionally think about that contribute to cross presentation. Now we'd love to obviously inhibit TAP and see if these can be disrupted by TAP inhibition or all these like really nice uh, additional models that have been proposed for cross presentation. Um, where the antigens and the peptides are, where the peptides are being loaded, I don't know. Like you could imagine a model where these peptides have been, the proteins are being secreted by TB extracellularly, but then in order for those to then be presented on MHC class one, you would still need some extracellular degradation machinery to make them appropriately length peptides that we could loaded totally extracellular without ever being phagocytosed. Um, one of the experiments that we're working on right now is to really distinguish between whether the infect directly infected cell versus the bystander cell is presenting because you know to that to your point if it's like extracellular loading you could hypothesize that the 
even the uninfected bystander, which has no TB inside, but maybe has seen peptides, can also then present. So we're working on those experiments now to distinguish between what happens in the GFP positive cell versus the GFP negative cell. And I hope that we'll be able to be able to answer that question in probably about three months. That's really cool. Thanks. Um, so Fred, do you want to unmute yourself? Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, thanks, Brian. That was an amazing talk. Um, I have kind of two questions. Yeah. One is, obviously, you're still trying to figure out um, how these antigens are being processed and presented on MHC class one, and you're looking at the various different pathways. Did you say that proteasomal inhibition doesn't affect the presentation of the, I'm calling it ESAT6 and, uh, peptide? Yeah, so that is um, that is true. That is what we found. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit about how the experiment was designed, um, just to kind of to be, be cognizant of all the caveats in the interpretation. So one way that we did the experiment is we let the infection go for 48 hours, then we added MG132, and then we looked at 72 hours, but we were worried that, okay, in those first 48 hours, then you could have loaded, and then inhibiting after 48 hours, that ha would have no effect, that, like, that may decrease, but it shouldn't maybe eliminate, and that's what we actually saw. So if we did 48 hours and then, um, and then added MG132, we saw no impact. So then we said, okay, let's try it differently. So the other alternative way that we designed the experiment is that we actually pre-treated with MG132 for four hours prior to even adding bacteria. And then we kept MG132 in for 24 hours. And then we let the experiment go for 24 hours because we were worried that going for too long, we would just like, that we would kill the cells. So we confirmed everything by Western blot. So we see the accumulation of K48 linked ubiquitin. Um, we saw everything that we saw all the textbook things. And then we saw no impact on the ESXA peptides. Now, really remarkably, what we see is like all the host derived peptides. If we so we are actually as an additional control, we started tracking in host peptides and those are all doing the right thing. Right. So we know that we are inhibiting the proteasome. It's just the loading of TB derived peptides seems to be independent of, of, of inhibiting the MG132 inhibitable proteasome activity. Um, well, I was wondering, I know you, you looked at the phagosomal pathway as well, but did you specifically look at auto, autophagy seen as the, the, the bog or the proteins are getting into the cytoplasm? Is there an autophagosome forming that's somehow helping antigen presentation at all? So and I know actually, there's a lot of the same machinery used, so it's probably hard to be specific. So that's actually something we're really excited about because P62 is clearly an autophagy adapter, SQ, SQSTM1. So we do see P62 being uh, recruited to MTB-containing phagosomes. So we're really excited to start to pee, peel that part apart. What we're trying to actually do, this sounds like a crazy experiment, but we're going to try it anyways, is um, we are trying to use the, our T cell clone with a now CRISPR macrophage library to see which macrophages that T cell can then actually recognize. So if we like started to like inhibit host pathways or like and like then look for T cell recognition. So we're hoping that in seven because now the T cell co culture is far cheaper both in resources and time than the mass spec experiments were. We're hoping that we can start to perturb additional host pathways and look at T cell act the activation of that T cell clone as a proxy and then kind of go back and see if that was consistent with altered presentation. That's really cool. Right, thanks very much, Juan. Thanks, Matthew. That's okay. Thanks, Fred. Um, Juan, you're up next. You're muted as well. Amazing talk, Brian. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was just wondering about, and this is probably, I didn't get it um, um, when, when, when you were talking about it, but um, if you consistently see peptides from the secretion system, um, I wonder if, if this system is under evolutionary pressure to adapt, to change, um, is, it, is, it, is, is this the right way to think about this? Um, um, you know, you would think that if it's something that's being presented all the time to the immune system, you want to change that, right? Or is it something that you, you want to keep? I, I'm not sure, you know, um, yeah. Okay, so um, this is one of my deep fascinations in life. 
um, thinking about how, how to model evolutionary pressure um, for a highly heterogeneous process, right? When you think about antibiotic selection, you can think about a very homogeneous pressure that gives rise to the selective pressure. By contrast, like when I think about the evolutionary pressure of T cell recognition, right, on a TB derived peptide, because if you looked even at that, those marker, the immunofluorescence of co localization of markers, it's not every TB containing phagosome is even doing this, right? And so, um, so I'm very fascinated about understanding how we can model this evolutionary pressure imposed by T cells on these peptides. People have done previous analyses where they have looked at immunodominant epitopes and looked at kind of their sequence conservation across multiple different um, sequenced isolates. And the peptides that we're seeing are not, don't have high substitution ratios. But if you look over, if you model evolutionary time over a longer time scale and look at what loci are, seem to be under se pressure, selection pressure in humans, it's mm -hmm. actually this ESX1 system is under some amount of selection pressure oh, wow. more so than any. So we're yeah. like, I'm really excited to dig into that a little bit more thinking about like, okay, if we take our transposome mutant and try to reconstitute in these, diff these different SNPs, does this mean that, you know, loss of activity? Cause it's, it's kind of, what's kind of fascinating to me is like everybody talks about ESX1 as a virulent system. Mm -hmm. um, and here's just, I think like an interesting counterpoint that loss of activity of this system perhaps gives rise to better evasion. Exactly. Um, surveillance. So that's mm -hmm. very interesting to me to think about is that like there has to be, I think it's, you um, must imagine that there's gotta be some amount of balance between those two relative activities because the model that everybody posits is that damaging the phagosome reduces the effective concentration of antimicrobial metabolites. And mm -hmm. that like allows you to like come yeah. to equilibrium with the cytosol. But I, but you know, it's, 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 it's interesting to think that um, there may be alternative ways to think about the contribution of the secretion system and its activities. Well, it's very, very successful, one, right? Because you have long-term infections. So these are not infections that are clear rapidly. So mm -hmm. whatever whatever it is, it's, it's a really balanced system, I think. But it, yeah, um, it, it's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, and the the next question and uh, final question, but obviously anyone <laughs> anyone can raise your hand and ask, ask more questions, um, is from Medina, who says, brilliant talk, Brian, really rigorous approach. Uh, do you think MTB has any mechanisms to alter APC lymphocyte interactions? And could these influence cytotoxic activity? Okay, that's an, a that's a lovely question. Um, I want to know the answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think I think, you know, the the biggest thing that I think TB infection does is drive type 1 interferons. So I'm very interested in really understanding the influence of type 1 interferon signaling on cytotoxicity, cytotoxic programs, um, co-stimulatory marker expression on the surface of phagocytes. And you know, for that, we I'm so grateful to be able to like leverage everything that people have done in viral infection literature, especially um, and so I, I I would like to think that the answer is yes. Um, although you know the question that I I think we I think we don't we don't have any data to necessarily say that the interaction has been altered yet. Um, one question that I think about a lot is that if you think about cytotoxicity cytotoxicity requires the delivery of these cytotoxic granules and that requires like altered phagocyte membrane kind of fluidity and biochemistry in order to be able to effectively deliver these payloads. And so one of the things that I, because I'm kind of lipid obsessed right now, is thinking about the observations that people at um, Steve Bensinger's lab has made about like how interferon signaling alters um, membrane biochemistry, like host membrane, phagocyte membrane biochemistry specifically, and whether or not that might have any impact on the perforins, the granulations of the world to actually be able to function. So that's a hypothesis that I'd like to test going forward. I'm looking for postdocs, by the way, um, <laughs> a, but um, 
but yeah, so I don't have an answer yet, but I, it's something that I think is definitely, there's definitely many mechanisms that may be at play here that uh, could kind of, that host pathogen, the, res, the, the phagocyte response to infection could definitely reprogram or influence kind of how the, T, the cytotoxic effector interacts with the phagocyte. That's great. Thank you so much. And I'm sure people are going to be falling over themselves to uh, apply for the postdoc positions. Um, no, but thank you so much for a really beautiful talk. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, and yes, so in case you want to watch it again or catch up on any bits that you missed, this will be on the YouTube channel uh, fairly soon, um, as soon as I have a few spare minutes. And um, yeah, we'll be back again next time. Uh, this, I can't speak this time next week um, for three more speakers. Um, and yeah, if you have any any more questions for Brian, um, then uh, do you, would you just put your email address in the chat box if you're happy to? Um, yep. And then... I love questions and you can <laughs> even follow us on Twitter. Yep. Already do that. <laughs> um, no, but honestly thank you that was that was great and um i really look forward to reading the, the bio archive uh preprint awesome thank you thank uh, you for having me oh oh I, actually we have one last minute question <laughs> um so if you have time uh, donald yeah uh, is just asking if uh, mtb affects the mhc class 2 pathway yeah that's a really good question um so um yes in mouse it's been demonstrated that um that in murine macrophages that there is an influence at high multiplicity of infection on MHC class two presentation. Um, in we're only starting to tackle this question in part, you know, the I'm rewriting history in a lot of ways. Like we wanted to do this with class two first, but the antibody for class two for human cells works worse. And so we just like we just like class one was working. So we're like, let's go for it. Um, so you know, one of the interesting things to think about is, you know, if you're thinking about um, the fa the phagocyte um, and whether or not the actual, one of the things that I think about is like, okay, um, does loss of ESX1 activity actually effectively increase the concentration of antigens in the phagosome and then bias you towards more class two presentation? So this is kind of another hypothesis is like, basically when you could access one mecha one antigen processing uh, pathway or the other, MHC class one or two, does um, permeabilizing the phagosome bias you to a CD4 response as opposed to a CD8 response? That's just a hypothesis at present. We're working on the experiments now to be able to look at kind of antigen concentration in the phagosome and ask whether or not um, TB's loss of ESX1 activity means an effective increase in concentration at the phagosome. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, okay, well, uh, with that, you know, we've taken plenty of your time, <laughs> um, but thank you again. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing more from the lab. Awesome, thanks so much. Thanks so much. And see all right. you all next Bye. week, everyone. Bye.